Hello YouTube, it's Amanda again, and today I have a very special guest. As promised, this is my husband, and his name is Keith. You can tell everybody hello. Hello YouTube. <laughs> and today we have a very special start of a series of videos for you, and that is the science of beer. I want to first talk about why we wanted to do this, and then I'm going to talk to Keith a little bit about his scientific background, and then we're going to do an overview of the brewing process in general, and recommend a couple of starter books for people who might be interested in trying this for the first time on their own. So the reason why I wanted to do this and wanted this to be part of the channel is something that Keith and I have actually talked about a couple of times, and that is a question that we get a lot from students that I have had in the past and that he still continues to have. And that is, why do I have to learn this? I'm never going to use this. And we want to showcase the science that is around you that you may not be aware of. So the science in everyday life. And we want to do that through things that people can easily identify with and that you see around you all the time, like beer. Okay, so, so to start a little bit about your background, um, so what is your degree and what is your degree in and what do you research? Right, so I am a physiologist. Uh, my PhD is in physio physiology. Um, however, most of my work is done in neuroscience and I have done some sensory science. Could you expand a little on sensory science and how that could potentially relate to what we're going to talk about today? Sure, actually, so by sensory science I mean the science of taste and smell. And so I think that fits in very well with what we're going to do today, which is talk about beer. Okay. And you've also done some ingestive behavior work, right? Yep, I have. Yeah, so uh, we're going to consume a little while we talk about this, so hopefully this continues to be on track. So the first thing that I want to bring up is a couple of the book recommendations. So if you are interested in this topic and you want to learn more about the brewing process and maybe even start off with a few recipes, I would recommend not only starting off with a recipe when you first start, would you concur? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, it's like, uh, it's like cooking. You know, you don't just go into the kitchen and start throwing the game, things together. Or maybe you do, but you're probably not going to have the best results. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend either finding something online, lots of resources online. Um, also, there are some great books. So, coming back to the book, the Brewing Classic Styles, and I will put links to all of the information that we talk about in the description bar down below. Uh, do you think this would be a good place to start, and what do you think about the book in general? Yeah, so the book is great, and yeah, I would definitely say it's, it's a really good resource for someone who's wanting to learn, um, especially if you want to learn how to design your own beers. And also, they do a lot of the science behind um, why you do certain things and why you use the ingredients and what each ingredient actually um, is used for. Um, and these, these two guys are, are legends in um, both brewing and home brewing, so uh, definitely recommend this book. And the second book that I would like to recommend is Designing Great Beers. And this is another sort of introductory book, and it doesn't go in great detail in any of the one components, which we will get into in the next video. Um, but it has a nice kind of overview of all the different kind of styles for beer, and that's also something that's very important, right? right. So that you have to have your final style in mind when you're designing the ingredients, so you know what to add and kind of what the final product would be like. Absolutely. Right? So, on that note, we're also going to talk a little bit about the overview of the brewing process. And I'm going to insert at some point, somewhere, I've lost my insert space because I have a guest, uh, little clips of what we're talking about so that you know the terminology so that when we talk about alpha acids or beta acids or if we talk about, um, what's another term, that, like the protein break? Protein break. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So stuff like that. The sparge. You'll, the sparge. Yeah, it's the sparge. We're not talking about an evil villain in a superhero movie. We're actually talking about a specific point in the brewing process. What a great idea, though. The, a the, superhero the, named the sparge. <laughs> I would totally watch that. <laughs> While drinking a beer. While drinking a beer. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're going to go through the overall process so that you know in the later videos what we're talking about for each of the different major steps. So what are the major components of beer? What are the, the main ingredients? Right, well, um, so number one, you need water. That's, that's the biggest ingredient. It's the one that's probably most often overlooked as well. And in fact, um, one of the authors of the first book you showed, uh, which is John Palmer, um, actually wrote an entire book about water and how certain uh, regions have different styles of water, different kinds of water, different mineral components in the water. And all those minerals and all the, the things that are in the water actually add a lot to the beer, but it's something that's, that's commonly overlooked. Then secondly, you need grain. 
um, and usually we're talking about uh, malted barley. Although other things can be used like wheat, sometimes corn, even oats. Um, but that's where the sugar comes from, and that's what the yeast will eventually uh, eat to make um, to make the alcohol and also to make um, the flavors for the beer. Um, and so I just mentioned the other one, which is yeast, so I kind of <laughs> gave it away. Yeast uh, is the organism, it's kind of the part that does all the heavy lifting. Um, when I say that I brew beer, I do that, I brew beer. But the yeast actually makes the beer. So I kind of set up the situation, set up the, uh, the components in a way that the yeast can do its job. But really without the yeast, you're just not going to have beer. Um, and then finally, we have things like um, hops, which is um, an herb, it's a flower uh, part of a, of a vine. The hop cone. Um, and right. I'll try to insert a, a, a visual representation of that so you know what we talk about when we talk about hops. Yep. And they come in multiple forms now too. So you have extracts and grain right. and pellets for hops and you also have whole cones, yep. right? Absolutely. Yeah, and really to brew beer, the f all you need is a pot and then somewhere to ferment it. And, and that could just be a bucket. I mean. Beer is not that difficult to make, and you don't need a bunch of expensive equipment. It's like any hobby, where to get into it and do the very basic, um, basic stuff, you could probably spend 50 bucks and make and start making beer. But then people could also spend thousands. Like, like YouTube. Like, like YouTube. Like YouTube. Yes. <laughs> and then there is one final component that um, most people also overlook, but it's also equally important, which is facial hair. And so <laughs> I highly recommend that the first thing you do before you look at ingredients is grow a beard. And if you can't, then you have to get a mammal that has facial hair. So I don't have a lot of facial hair or any head hair really to speak of, so I had to have a brew dog. So what if I brew? A brew dog substitute? Yeah, you substitute okay. brew dog. Yeah. Border collie substitutes for all. Okay, so I want to do the general steps now. So we've talked about the major components, we've talked about the ingredients basically. So now what do you do with them? How how do you make those four things become beer. And we're also gonna talk some biochemistry in some of the next videos. Okay. So having an idea of what is going on within each of these steps. So this will be an overview just so that you can understand what we're talking about later. So would you like to talk a little bit about the first step of beer? Sure, uh, the first step really, if assuming that your water is the way you want it, is um, to heat the water and then to add the grain to the hot water. And it's important that you have the right temperature for the water because what you're doing is you're activating enzymes in the grain that is going to uh, then break down the sugars that's also in the grain um, to create what's called wort. And wort is just unferm unfermented beer. And you're not saying wort. No, it's like spelled on your face. right. It's spelled W O R T, but it's pronounced wort. I thought for the first year that he did this that it was called wort. So most people do actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just to clarify, so you don't make that mistake when you're talking to someone about this later, wort. Right. Right. And so you're shooting for an ideal temperature because, um, as you may or may not know, um, enzymes have ideal temperature ranges, and so you want to break down the sugar in such a way that it's the the kind of sugar and the quality of the sugar that the yeast uh, prefer. So then after you have that, you have your wort, uh, the next step is to bring that wort to a boil. So you're going to drain off all the, the liquid, which is now your, uh, your pre-beer, if you will. <laughs> and then you're going to heat that um, you, to a boil. Um, so the grains are moved now, right? right yeah, so we just no have liquid the, product, right. we've separated the liquid and solid components up to this point. Right. Then once the, once the uh, wort comes to a boil, you're going to add your hops. Um, and then the hops are there to add both flavor and bittering. And the earlier in the boil, that you add the hops, the more bitterness you're going to have, and the later you add it, the more flavor you're going to have. Um, and also the variety of hops is going to determine that as well. Um, so then you boil for anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes. You can't go even longer than that. Um, and then once the boil is finished, um, then you may add a few more hops at the end just to add some more flavor. To so it, I what if I want something that's seasonal? So not just the style. I've decided on a stout, but I, I want a pumpkin stout because it's that time of year where we put right. pumpkin in right. everything. Absolutely. So what, what kinds of things would it, and when would I add them to, to add outside flavors that you may not be able to obtain from selecting yeast, hops, and you know different strains of things? Right. Well, so you can really add just about anything to a beer. Um, you want to stay away from things that are oily. Um, because that tends to cause loss of head retention, which is, if you know what the head of a beer is, it's the nice little fluffy thing on the, it's on top of it. Um, and that will be really compromised if you have lots of oily ingredients. Also, you have to think about um, what's going to happen to your beer 
um, with these things in it. Obviously, if you add pumpkin puree to your boil, you're going to have a very, very cloudy beer. It's probably going to settle out eventually, but it, just, it also makes it a nightmare to work with in transfer, where you have sludge as opposed yeah. to this nice liquid. And do you also, so the head retention, does that also affect the aromatics, so the way the beer, because head retention is right. involved in that, um, right? Yeah, so some, to a degree, yes. So, so all the bubbles that are actually in the head, so it's basically a foam, and all the bubbles that are in that foam have whatever volatile chemicals you put in it. So whatever, whatever aromas are in that beer are held in the head. And so whenever you take a sip, you also get that, that nasal sort of thing too. Um, so in addition to having the hop flavor or the beer flavor um, coming from your mouth and then into your throat and into your nose, which we call retronasal olfaction, which is more science for you, um, you also get just true nasal olfaction, which is the smell that comes up out of the glass. So the head is important for that. Okay. Sorry, I completely broke it nope. with random questions, but totally next fine. step, sorry. So yeah, so then once it's cooled, um, and we usually want to cool this very rapidly because um, yeast aren't the only microorganisms that like to eat wort. Uh, also, bacteria can get in very easily. And so when you think about like food preparation in a, in a restaurant or something, you, there are certain temperature zones you're trying to avoid. And so around 120 degrees Fahrenheit, you enter that magical zone that bacteria love to live in. And we don't want that in the beer. Right. Well, so sometimes you want that in the beer. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you want, you want that, beer. but what we're doing for this video, we did not want right. that. Right. So you want to control your environment as much as humanly possible. Okay. And so um, we will rapidly cool the wort uh, using um, what, well, different we types a, of things. But we have a homemade version. Right. So exactly. We did not buy right. one. We coiled uh, copper piping ourselves. Right. But it's called a wort chiller, so it does it very quickly. Um, the good thing is, and if, if you live in a very cold area, or it's winter, or there's snow, you can just use the natural environment. Um, I've cooled beer several times just by putting the brew pot into um, snow. Um, but anyway, so then you're going to transfer this now cooled wort into a completely sterilized uh, fermentation vessel. It could be a, a carboy, or like I said, a plastic bucket. Those are actually pretty common. With a lid. Um, with a lid, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, and everything that touches the beer after it's started to cool has to be sterilized. And we use, um, we get things from the homebrew shop that is, is uh, very effective for sterilizing, yeah. And it's, it's uh, like I said, it's really, really important because anything that touches the beer at this point is probably going to affect the fermentation. So if it's, if it's, if it's a bacteria... Um, Does that cause off flavors in the beer yeah, as well? Yeah, it, it actually, absolutely. And you can have... Um, you can get lucky and the beer can be contaminated and be delicious at the end if you like sour beers, um, but more often than not, you're gonna end up with something that you just have to throw down the sink. So, yeah, and then after um, you've got your, your wort transferred to um, a fermentation vessel, then you're gonna add your yeast, and we call this pitching. And that's why it has to be cool too, right? Right. Because if it's, if it's warm, yeast is a living organism, and that's how this right. reaction actually yeah. takes place. So you kill it. Right. And temperature is also very important for the fermentation because just like uh, any other organism, yeast have um, the ideal temperatures they really enjoy to live in. Um, and they'll continue to ferment even if they're outside that temperature range. But if the yeast is stressed, you also get these off flavors. Okay. Because yeast, in addition to making alcohol, also produce lots of, of different flavors in beer. Uh, for example, if you have like a Hefeweizen, for example, um, that has these trademark flavors of clove and bananas. And that comes from the yeast. There's not clove or bananas in the, in the actual product. It's just that the yeast produce these, these compounds that smell and taste very much like those things. Okay. Um, yeah, so fermentation takes anywhere from three days if you're doing a very small uh, batch with a lot of aggressive yeast. Okay. Um, all the way up to, you know, for comp uh, complex fermentations involving several different yeasts or even microorganisms like the bacteria, it can take several years. Really? It can, yeah. For a home brewer, what is the average that you typically wait? And how do you know when a beer is done? Right, so one to two weeks is a, probably the average for a beer to ferment. Um, and a beer, you know a beer is done because you take gravity readings. So sugar creates a much thicker, more viscous uh, liquid than alcohol does, because alcohol is lighter than water. Mm -hmm. And so as the yeast start to break down um, the sugars and create alcohol, the beer gets lighter and lighter, okay, so less, also less dense. Yeah. And so we test the density, and once the density is stable for three days, you know that your beer is pretty much done. Okay, 
And this is how you know the final alcohol content too. So you're right. taking measurements along the way and we're going to explain what those measurements are and how you use them in your calculations for the final uh, final alcohol content. What yep. is the, what, how do you, what's the, how do you, do you, is it a range that you normally end with or what is an average that you can, can, can you, can you do a wide range of APVs at home? Absolutely. Um, so I'll just give you the biggest beer that I've ever fermented without using a distillation process um, was around 16% alcohol. Um, wasn't very good, but it no, was. No, I remember that one. That <laughs> but was, it, was, it was really not good. It was quite boozy though. If you want to, if you just want to make some nice cleaning fluid or something, or you know, we need something to. <laughs> no, put into we won't a lamp recommend or, doing that. We're, we'll, what, what is for drinkable? For drinkable yeah, beer, yeah. What, what, what and I'm range? sure I'm sure that people could do 16% alcohol beers and make it wonderful, wonderfully. But I did not do that. <laughs> I, apparently, I can't do it, but I'm sure some people can. Um, yeah, I think within like the lower end. Um, I just finished a beer that finished at 3.9% alcohol, so it's a, like a light lager or something. So we have made beer, and you know the alcohol content. So can you just drink it like that, or sure. what would you do? How does it get carbonation? If, if you How don't does mind, it become fizzy? If you don't mind room temperature flat beer, you could drink it all day long, <laughs> just like that. I think it's that's going to be rejected by most. Completely though. safe to drink at that point. However, there are really there's two ways to carbonate. There are probably more than that. Actually, I've seen I've seen people force carb with dry ice, which is really unusual. No. I wouldn't recommend it. I it's uh, recommend it's quite it. dangerous, but. Usually the, the two major ways is through bottle conditioning, which is where you give the yeast right at the end. It's eaten all the sugar that it, that it had access to. And so you add a little bit more sugar and then you put it in bottles. And the yeast will then um, eat those sugars. And I said that you know when, when the yeast break down the sugars, they create alcohol. Well, they also create CO2. And you'll see the CO2 bubbling um, as it's fermenting. From the airlock. Right. But when you put it into a bottle and you cap the bottle, now there's nowhere for the CO2 to go. And so it just absorbs into or dissolves into the beer and you end up with carbonated beer. Okay. So also we use calculators to determine exactly how much sugar to add because if you add too little, your beer is flat. If you add too much, they will explode. Yeah, beer That's bombs. Right. Beer bombs. We've had a couple of those when we were first starting to do I this. I remember. What you're talking about, didn't yeah, I? yeah. I remember. <laughs> the first beer that you made, remember? Was, yeah. I think it was the first or the second one. It was, yeah. I think the first one went well and then the second one exploded. So, <laughs> but we haven't had that in a long time. That was like five right. years ago. So, when and we say explode, we don't mean that it's like there's it just pops and then you have broken no. glass and it's it's inconvenient. No, this will actually send shards of glass into your walls. And we know that. We do know that. And now we are much more careful about that because we realized after yep. picking glass out of the walls that that's possible. So, I guess that's the overview from the... Oh, I didn't, time. I didn't give the second way to Carl. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, second sorry, way, sorry. second way. So my favorite, yeah. the reason it's, that this is very... You just started doing yeah, this, just, so he's super excited I, about I it. I have new toys, and I'm really happy. <laughs> um, the other way is that you, you put it into a keg, just like any commercial uh, brewery or um, mm -hmm. a bar or something would do. That you can buy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You can buy, you can even buy the used ones from old breweries or brew pubs or something. Yeah, that's a more advanced thing though, because it's more of an investment. If you decide that this is something that you do want to go forward with, that then you right. typically do the kegging. Before bottles, you can actually recycle bottles that you get from other, I mean, it's an encouragement to drink more beer. Because <laughs> I mean, I have because to, that's how you get bottles. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do some field work later today probably. Oh, you are? Yeah, Okay. pick up some, some more bottles. Some well, collections? I'm just, I'm just putting together bottles. Funding right your now. habit, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is our first sort of overview of the beer making process and we've we've said a few science terms I guess that we'll define later and some of the biochemistry involved in each of those steps to get the banana esters and the nutty flavors and chocolate notes that you get in the final product, where those come from and how to avoid things like band-aid and what is it, horse blanket? No, actually, that was, it's, uh, it's a good no, thing. No, that's not it's good. You keep for, saying that. It is. For, it is for not. some sour beers, you want that. For some, all right. Some Everybody likes different things. Horse blanket is not a flavor I would shoot for. Is that fair? Okay, that's fair. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we hope that you enjoyed this. And remember that we're going to go through each of those important kind of stop points along the way for where the final product can be altered and the different chemical processes that are going on in each of those steps in our next video. Thank you for watching and if you have questions or if you have other kind of recommendations along this line, this is going to start being a regular thing here at A Scientist Reads, which we're thinking about changing to the nerd scientists or something along those lines since now there's more than one scientist involved. 
I will talk with you soon. Bye. Cheers.